uh, six years ago, we needed a new car. So went about and saw a nice advertising at a national dealership. So we made an appointment to have the test drive with the car, to take it out for a spin. And we were very impressed by the functionality of the car, so we wanted to buy it. So you negotiate with the salesperson, and we agreed on a price. And then you have to make the paperwork work. So you sit down on the desk of the salesperson, uh, and then he asks us a question that I still remember today. I said, okay, how do you want to pay for your car? And I said, well, how do you mean? Well, we have this nice financing option for you. It's possible to take out a loan to pay for your car. And as a finance professor, I became interested. I said, a loan? I'm buying a second-hand car. Why do you offer me a loan? Is that very common? And the salesperson relaxed and said back, oh, yeah, majority of our cars are being financed by loans that we offer to them. And if we don't offer them, then the competition down the road will offer them to the clients and they will never come back to us. So I think in hindsight, that was the moment I realized that I was motivated to do something with nudging and financial decision making. So nudging, what is nudging? So you might not realize this, but everybody in this room and maybe uh, viewers at home have experienced nudging day by day. Let me give an example. So for example, if you have to go to Tilburg University, if you went by car, you probably have seen this sign, take a turn to the university. And then if you, oh, by train, you come at the, at the campus, you basically have seen uh, a sign that gets a direction to the auditorium where this event is taking place. And this is basically a nudge. Yeah? It's, a, it's a push in a certain direction. You don't have to follow it, but in, in case of a, of a sign, it's better that you do, otherwise you end up in a different way. Yeah? So that's a nudge. And what I'm going to tell you is about four different financial decisions that can influence our lives. So let us take a look at the Smith family. Smith family is a happily married family and has two kids, and they are faced with financial decisions almost every day. And the first decision is about their gas and electricity bill. Every year, there is this piece of paper they receive, what is their annual consumption? And what they realized is that the last two years, these bills look a little bit different. Yeah? There is a small graph added to that, this one. And it shows you that the consumption of the Smith family is higher than of their neighbors. And there are even some neighbors that are even more efficient in energy consumption. And this small nudge makes them realize that they are maybe consuming too much energy. And because of this, they are thinking, what can we do about this? And by, just by adding this small graph, it has been shown that overall about 3% can be saved in energy reduction. And 3% doesn't <coughs> look like much, but it saves you money, and it also saves the entire society as a whole. Yeah, so just a simple nudge can save you money. Another thing that's very important for the family is, uh, is saving. Um, and in the past, what happened if grandfather came home, uh, he had this paycheck, well, it was not really a paycheck, it was something like this, a little sack of money, cash money, and he brought it back and probably gave it to his wife, and what his wife did, basically put it in small boxes, <laughs> yeah? Because you have to pay for your energy, you have to pay for taxes, you have to pay for food in order to put food on the table. Yeah? So things go forward, and what people nowadays have, well, just before the internet age, was that we have bank accounts. And instead of the little, you had these little booklets, yeah? where you went, you deposited your check on the bank account, and they wrote down how much money you had on your saving account. Nowadays, things are much more easier. Now what you have is just an account, and what you see here is that the Smith family has saved some money. And that's, that's good, yeah? You have, to, you have some money on the bank. The drawback of this is that people have the tendency to spend money. If they have the money and they see some nice offer, they, they will spend this. So overall, if you put all your money in one account, it's not good news, basically. You, you spend it too much. So what did banks do about five years ago? They innovated. They brought back the little box and digitized it. And they call this target saving. So what you have in your account, instead of opening several accounts, what you can do within the same saving account, you have targets, in this case, a nice anniversary, 
or the holiday they were looking for, the kids are growing up a little bit so they can go for this nice world trip. And of course, similar like me, maybe they want to buy a car when their old one is dying. And you see they have enough money to buy the car, but there are also other things they want to do. So this is a good thing. Overall, just by doing this, it has been shown that people have the tendency to, to save more because they have these targets in their mind. If you have a goal, you have the tendency to try to reach that goal. There is also a drawback. Because you have this mental capacity that you want to save for this goal, if something unexpected happens, for example, their refrigerator dies, then if they want to replace their refrigerator, they have, some people have the tendency, instead of keep taking the money from their bank account, they have the tendency to take out a loan. Yeah? And similar like me, well, do you want to take out a loan to buy a refrigerator, even if you have the money? So uh, in the line of the crisis, 2008 uh, crisis, financial crisis, the Dutch government realized that a lot of people in the Netherlands, they, they had too many loans. It's not only in the Netherlands, it's everywhere in the world. So it might be better to warn them about the side effects of loans. So there is a mandatory label introduced in the Netherlands, and th that's this one. This is the Dutch version. I immediately switched to the English version so that everybody can read this. And it is a, a warning label that you have to attach if a loan offer is being made. And the sentence says, be careful, borrowing money will cost you money. And there is this small picture where there is a chain to a euro symbol. So uh, yeah, a loan is, is some, something like a burden. Yeah? So this is very interesting. Does a nudge like this, a warning label, help you prevent out to take out a loan? Well, our financial regulator did some research about this. And they find out that 73% of the people, they realized because of this warning message that indeed taking out a loan is maybe not optimal for me. 65% of the people could literally rephrase this, this small sentence. They, they knew it by heart. Yeah? 84% of the people agreed with the message in total. And a whopping 95% of the people, they, they really knew what this little picture was about. Yeah, so be careful if you take out a loan, you have to pay it back and you have to pay annual or, or monthly payments as well. So now go back to the Smith family. Suppose now, we know this, they are saving for a car. Suppose now they find a nice car. They go to a dealership, they're being offered a loan, similar to me, six years ago. Will they take it or not? Or will this warning label help them to prevent them to take out a loan or not? Well, as a teacher and as a researcher, I'm uh, happy always to work together with uh, students who have to write a end, end of year paper. And this one student came to my office and said, I want to investigate this. I want to investigate if people are offered a loan for a car, do they take that when such a warning label is presented to them or not? And what they did, he did two experiments. He did one experiment among a group of people that are not very likely to purchase a car, say students, and another group of people that are very similar to me six years ago. People that walk into a dealership looking for a car, something like the Smith family is wanted to do now as well with this car. Yeah? So what did they find? Well, this is the first group. And here it shows that the, the warning label has an effect. The probability of people willing to take out a loan if they are offered one is much larger if the uh, warning label is not presented respectively to the, when the label is presented. So you would say, as an economist, this is good news. People understand the warning label and they also act accordingly. And then we look at the second group, people that go into a dealership and there the news is not that good. There you see that overall the probability is more or less the same. So I went into the dealership six years ago. I, didn't, I, I was not presented with such a warning label. I, well, I didn't take a loan, but I could have. But you see that the Smith family, if they run into the uh, dealership right now, they are presenters with this mandatory label and they have an even higher probability of taking out a loan. So maybe they think, we don't have that much money, we cannot afford a car and a holiday and anniversary, but now a loan offer is made to us, so we can. Yeah? But does this 
really help them? Does this mandatory warning label help them prevent to take out a loan? And we'll have to see later on. So the fourth and final decision the family Smith is uh, confronted with is about investing. So Mr. Smith is thinking of maybe early retirement, maybe one or two years early retirement, or maybe they want to save some money in order to uh, put their children through college. And investing is a very difficult decision. It's not easy. I'm teaching finance, I can assure you, even finance people have difficulties with uh, the investing decision. And the two things that they have most difficulties with is um, risk, what, uh, what is the appropriate risk level of an investment, and the second, and that's even more important, is about the fees. How much money do I really put in a fund and how much money they take in fees? So together with some colleagues, we investigated this. And our question was, does adding simple pictures, simple nudges, help people to prevent to invest in very expensive funds? So how did we go about? Well, first I'm gonna show you the pictures. This picture shows you riskiness. And you see the guy is uh, carrying a heavy load. And this picture is used in Netherlands already for almost 10 years. And then the second picture it's not about risk, but it's about the fees. And that's this picture. The gray area tells you how much the Smith family is putting in an investment fund, and the line represents how much the expected returns are after deduction of fees. And what you see here is that the line that starts in the gray area, so that means that they, once they start investing, they have to pay fees up front, and it takes them, well, even more than 12 months to recuperate all these fees. Yeah, so based on this picture, you could argue this is an expensive fund to invest in, and the Smith family shouldn't do that. Yeah? Maybe there are better options. But maybe this picture allows them to look for alternatives. So what did we do? We did a kind of an experiment, and we separated uh, our participants in four different groups. There was one group that was given the information about the funds in text and tables. There was another group that received exactly the same information, but the picture about risk was included as well. A third group was also the text and table information, and then we have this net of fees picture. And then the final group had them both. And a lot of things you can investigate, but what we looked at initially was, what about the fees? What are the average fees of these different groups? So, relative to the first group, is it possible that the other groups have lower transaction costs, so they have lesser fees. And what we find is that there is a 12% reduction in fees if you enter this small risk picture. So it helps people to reduce costs. If you add this net expected return picture, we see a whopping 18% reduction in fees. And finally, if you add both pictures, there's a 24% reduction in fees. 24% reduction in fees, that's a lot. And if you do a back of the envelope calculation, for the US alone, that would save an $800 million a year. And for the Smith family, it means perhaps that Mr. Smith can retire one or maybe two years earlier, or it's possible to finance one or two years of college education for their kids. Yeah, four different nudges, four different financial decisions. So what did the family do ultimately? Let's see, here they are. Happily, in nice in the sun, packed their bags because what they decided is to go on a holiday and together on the holiday with the kids, they celebrate their anniversary and this way they save a little bit of money so that they can buy earlier a new or second-hand car without taking any loans. And maybe they also have some time to see what they can do about the energy bill as well. <laughs> That's my talk. Thank you.